Five years ago, Dan Werb published a startling essay in the Walrus magazine entitled Oxytown. It stared down the grim situation unfolding in small Ontario communities hit by the opioid crisis, as was happening in the region of Chatham-Kent. Dan Werb is an epidemiologist and holds a dual appointment as assistant professor at the University of Toronto and in the Division of Global Public Health at the University of California, San Diego. And he joins us now via Skype from Halifax, Nova Scotia for an update. Dan, it's good to see you again. I, I, I guess I hesitate to say that because the fact that you're back here means that this is still a big problem. And I want to just share with you and our viewers off the top here uh, some numbers. This is from Public Health Ontario. Most people expect, of course, Toronto to be leading the way, 291 deaths between July 2017 and June 2018. But look at this, Hamilton 84, Niagara 83, Thunder Bay 35, Sudbury 28, Peterborough 22. Um, this is uh, not a phenomenon of just the big cities. And it's worth noting as well that Thunder Bay's per capita death rate is 23 deaths per 100,000 people. That's the highest in the province. And it's almost three times higher than the provincial per capita death rate of eight opioid deaths per 100,000. What is it, Dan, about our smaller municipalities that make them apparently so susceptible to this phenomenon? Yeah, thanks for having me back, Steve. And uh, as you say, unfortunately, things don't seem to have gotten better in the last uh, five years or so. And, and in fact, in a lot of ways, they've gotten worse. And I think, you know, one of the main, th there are two major reasons for that. One is the ongoing contamination of the street opioid supply with high potency opioids like fentanyl and carfentanil, which uh, are associated with a super high risk of overdose uh, and death. And the other is the fact that for a lot of these smaller communities, you know, Canada has been an innovator in terms of harm reduction, in terms of overdose prevention. You see supervised injection facilities uh, opening up across the country. Naloxone, uh, which is an overdose reversal drug being uh, disseminated across uh, large municipalities. But some of those innovations have not yet reached the smaller communities. But I think that, you know, a lot of the, the education, a lot of the technical expertise, both in terms of identifying people who uh, potentially have uh, an opioid use disorder and are at high risk of overdose, that again is, you know, uh, located more in uh, Canada's larger cities. So you've got a, a medical class, you've got physicians and nurses and, um, you know, other uh, social workers and counselors who are getting really, really good at identifying or who are trained in identifying opioid use disorder and, and uh, treating people effectively. But some of that te uh, technical expertise and that clinical expertise just hasn't yet uh, made its way out into um, smaller communities. Understood. Take us back five years to when you wrote that piece for the Walrus magazine that really caused a, a significant stir, and we had you on this program talking about it then. Um, what was the reaction, as you recall it, to the piece when it ran five years ago? Um, the, the reaction was overwhelmingly one, you know, I heard from a lot of people from Chatham, Kent and from smaller city or from smaller um, counties, particularly in Ontario, who said, you know, this really resonated with me. The stories of young people who had, um, you know, started using opioids through their uh, through finding them in their parents' medicine cabinets uh, or, um, you know, some stories of. Um, kids starting to inject steroids and then moving on to injecting opioids. There was some pushback, certainly, you know, some people felt like it was a mischaracterization of small town life. But what I found, you know, doing the research over the, you know, since then and, and at the time was that this depiction of, uh, uh, of communities that are faced with a public health crisis and really, um, you know, don't have the tools to handle it, uh, was true at the time, and unfortunately, I think it's it's even more true now, given that the uh, the toxicity in the opioid supply has just gotten more and more intense, and thereby the risk of overdose has gotten uh, higher and higher. That answer may go some distance towards answering the uh, follow-up that I was going to ask, which is the most significant change you have seen in the five years since your article came out. What would you say it is? Yeah, so, you know, at the time... We, we talk about 
nowadays we talk about an opioid opioid crisis, right? And 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 I would push back against that because really what we've got are are two overlapping public health problems. The one is the massive level of overprescribing of opioids that occurred over the past 10, 15, 20 years. That has abated a little bit uh, just in the past few years. But basically, you had um, clinicians who, for a number of reasons, including fraudulent marketing on the part of um, large pharmaceutical companies like Purdue Pharma, were excessively uh, prescribing opioids. And that led to a larger number of people who were who became addicted to opioids. On the and and aside from that, what you've got is a a legal market for opioids that was traditionally made up of heroin, but in the past five, 10 years or so has seen an increase in the level of fentanyl and carfentanyl, these super potent opioid formulations um, that unfortunately, uh, you know, carry a huge amount of um, overdose risk with them. So on the one hand, you've got a larger group of people who are potentially addicted to opioids, who are using opioids. And on the other, you've got the actual um, toxicity and danger associated with street opioids increasing. How much of it is that doctors, doctors, um, you know, would see people suffering and the compassion inside them uh, was speaking more loudly than perhaps their best professional judgment. And as a result, they gave out scripts that maybe they shouldn't have. Yeah, I, you know, and I, I, I think that I think that's true in a lot of cases. And I would say what that really amounts to is a lack of training in addiction medicine, right? So you've got really well-meaning clinicians who are confronted with people with legitimate pain, um, you know, be it from, uh, you know, hard work or, you know, work-related injuries that have back pain um, and then are prescribed opioids to treat that pain. And the thing about um, you know opioid use disorders is that they can manifest as pain, right? So somebody could be prescribed an opioid for a legitimate reason like pain, and then the, they're, they could become physically dependent on it, but the symptoms uh, remain, you know, the back pain that maybe they started with. And at that point, yes, it makes sense as a clinician that you would want to treat the pain that uh, of one of your patients. But what that amounts to, I think, in a lot of cases, is that Clinicians were not equipped with the tools, you know, and, and the training to identify when one of their patients has become addicted. And that led to, I think, essentially freestyling on the part of clinicians, right, where they're confronted now with their patients uh, who are now obviously, you know, dependent on opioids. And they are faced with a really impossible choice because many of them know that if they stop prescribing opioids, those patients will come, will go to the illegal market to try to find them. And, you know, in the context of a fentanyl saturated illegal market, that could be fatal. Um, and so they try to continue to kind of freestyle and try to maintain patients on, on opioids when, uh, in, you know, in fact, what they're lacking there is, is um, appropriate training in addiction medicine to identify ways to to manage that problem. Hmm. In spite of the stats and in spite of the piece that you wrote five years ago that we talked about then and, and are talking about again today, do you think there is a persistent view in society that this is somehow a big city problem and uh, really hasn't penetrated the more rural or um, northern areas of this province as much? Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, the, the initial graph or the initial numbers that you put up Obviously, Toronto being a big city um, dwarfs all the other municipalities in terms of the crude number, you know, the overall number of people who have died of overdose. Um, but when you break it down, as you mentioned, places like Thunder Bay, smaller areas have an overall higher um, rate of overdose death. And I think, you know, a huge part of that is that the public health apparatus, the, the surveillance systems that government has set up that you know, span decades and decades have overwhelmingly been focused on big cities, right? That's where the majority of drug-related problems were. That's where the larger population of people who inject drugs, who were potentially at risk of acquiring or transmitting diseases like HIV, were located. So it's not just um, about a perception. It's the fact that most of our data 
is coming from these larger cities where these surveillance systems have been set up. And so you, you've got a situation where, you know, everyone is playing catch up, right? I, I think, you know, the media is trying to better understand what's happening in rural areas uh, and the public health system, which as you can imagine, is just a massive infrastructure, is trying to reorient itself to better surveil what's happening in smaller municipalities. But that is a, a huge undertaking and takes time. So we're still at a point where our the best data that we've got is from the bigger cities, where you know we've got these surveillance systems that have been in place for 20, 30 years. Um, and we're still trying to figure out ways to capture data in smaller settings. Let me refer as well to some of your other work, namely City of Omens, the book you recently wrote about the situation in Tijuana, where uh, I gather the place has been overrun by drugs and prostitution, um, human depravity, uh, go on if you like. Are there parallels between the experience there and what you fear could happen here? Yeah, in so far as, uh, you know, so City of Omens is a book about uh, the sex trade and the overlap between sex trade and, and drug addiction. Where there are parallels with the Canadian context or specific, specifically around uh, the illegal drug market are in the saturation uh, of the drug market with fentanyl. So uh, Tijuana has historically been a, a key transit hub through which um, heroin uh, produced in Mexico and uh, cocaine produced in uh, the Andean region in South America have flown into the United States and then on to Canada's West Coast. What we've seen in the past few years in, in Tijuana, and again, this is exactly what we're seeing across Canada, is that heroin, the suppliers and producers of heroin, have started shifting towards producing fentanyl. So fentanyl, uh, by you know some estimates, is 50 to 100 times more powerful than heroin. So what that really means is, you know, it's a higher potency product so that it's essentially the same amount of drug in a much smaller package. And that kind of level of efficiency uh, is continual in the illegal drug market. And that's why we're seeing this global shift towards higher potency opioids, because essentially they're easier to track or they're, they're, they're harder to track and easier to ship through um, borders. You know, it, it may be less of the case now with the legalization of marijuana that the, the war on drugs may be coming to somewhat of an end now, but it's certainly been going on for several decades, and I wonder how effective you think that's been, the so-called war on drugs, in an attempt to stop the scourge of drug addiction. Well, it has not been effective at all. Um, and. Um... You know, I've, I've analyzed the, the global trends in the price impurity and availability of major drugs across North America. And what you see is that over the past 25, 30 years is that on average, the price of heroin, the price of cocaine, pre-regulation, pre the price of cannabis were all dropping, while the purity uh, of all of them and the potency in the case of cannabis were all skyrocketing, right? So what that tells you is there's an overabundance of supply. The, the availability is sky high and has been uh, only increasing over the past uh, decades when the drug war, the global drug war, was at its uh, most ferocious. Um, while I think the appetite for, um, you know, enforcement-driven, counter-narcotic-driven uh, drug policies in Canada have waned a little bit, they, they still are the norm. And until we figure out a way to effectively regulate um, the international trade in drugs. We're going to keep seeing this push towards greater efficiency, greater innovation in, uh, from the drug traffickers, which means just more and more potent products, which of course means uh, more potential for overdose and death. Well, dealing with the international market seems like a very huge mission. I wonder if we can go a little more laser-like onto what you think are potential options for improving the situation in our smaller towns and municipalities around the province of Ontario. Any ideas? Yeah, absolutely. So in the case of Thunder Bay, you know, Thunder Bay uh, is sort of a feeder community for a number of remote uh, rural, rural and remote and First Nations communities. So I think one of the reasons that uh, the uh, overdose death rate in uh, Thunder Bay is so elevated 
is that it's where lots of people from other smaller communities are coming uh, to get treated or, you know, if they are facing uh, or experiencing serious substance use disorders, might move from their um, home communities because of stigma and into the larger, the relatively larger municipality of Thunder Bay. So one of the things that we need to do is decentralize our system of care. And that means um, making sure that, um, you know, those clinicians and nurse practitioners and registered nurses and social workers that are skilled in treating and helping people manage their substance use disorders are made available in those smaller communities. Let me and jump in there, Dan, just is, for one second, because yeah. they, they've got something up there that they jokingly call the Tajma Hospital, a $400 million hospital. I, I would have thought that that's a pretty impressive um, you know, piece of health care to attack this problem. Not the case? Well, you know, you can build infrastructure, but you also need um, the expertise, right? And And one of the issues that we're facing is that the level of addiction medicine training across Canada is extremely varied. Um, in British Columbia, they've uh, developed a, a really strong training system of addiction medicine. There isn't something similar across Ontario. Like it just doesn't exist right now. And particularly in terms of applied addiction medicine, where you can, um, you know, where clinicians are trained to assess um, people on the ground doing frontline, you know, in, in the context of frontline care. So yeah, you can build massive infrastructure and and um, you know gleaming new um, hospitals, but you need the personnel who are trained in addiction medicine, and you know that that takes two things. One is making sure that Ontario has effective guidelines for addiction medicine training, and two that those people that are trained are made uh, or are not made, but um, are able to travel or are encouraged to travel to smaller communities to to treat those people in uh, rural and remote communities that are um, disproportionately affected by opioid use disorder. Good. Dan, thanks as always for coming onto our airwaves. Uh, Dan Werb from the University of Toronto, University of California at San Diego. More on this in his book, City of Omens, and of course, the original piece from five years ago in the Walrus Magazine. Good to talk to you again, Dan. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.